stuff. Now, uh, here's what I want you to think about as we get started. If you are a Christian, and I realize there are some people here who are, who are not yet uh, followers of Christ, um, but if you are, if you're a follower of Christ, uh, you are because God arranged it. Okay? And that's going to be a key word for us this morning, that God arranged it. Okay, So I want you to think about just people. I don't know what, how old you were when you came to Christ, uh, but, but God arranged, God put people in your life to help you come to the realization that you needed a Savior. Um, and so he, the, the people that have engaged you in life, that you've encountered in your life, that have led you toward Christ, whether they were the actual person or people that, that, that helped you to receive Christ at that moment, that there were people, there were probably lots of people that God put into your life, that, that you learned about the love of God, that you, you learned about what Jesus did on the cross and his conquest over death. You, you began to become aware of that. Some of you were really little, and it, and it may have been your parents or an older sibling, or maybe in your grandparents or Sunday school teacher, something like that. Some of you, others, it was later in life, but, but there, were, there were people that God put in the way, in your, pl- in the, in, in your path that, that helped bring you to Christ. And I think for me, the, there was a guy named Roger Peterson, and uh, Roger was... Um, he, he came in, moved into the, into the community that I grew up in when I was a junior in high school, and I was, I was a wrestler, and so he came in and he started volunteering uh, as a coach. And of course, being who I was as a, as a, at that point as a teenager, I thought, um, I, didn't know, I didn't know Roger, and I didn't know what he was going to be like or about, but I was kind of a little bit skeptical. And then when he was introduced to us, uh, our coach told us that, that uh, he's about 10 years older than me, so about 10 years er- earlier, he had taken second state uh, at the state wrestling tournament. And I thought, oh, okay, this is probably a good guy, right? right? Kind of brought my barriers down. And um, over the course of that season and the next season, I got to know Roger, and Roger got to know me, and I did not grow up in church at all, like, a, like far from God. And so I didn't know anything about uh, Christianity. I mean, I knew, I knew that there was such a thing, but I didn't even know what the thing was. You know what I'm saying? And, um, but, but Roger was the first guy that I can think of that I met that I, that I could say, that's a legitimate Christian. Like I was 17 years old, and I realized he's a Christian. He, he has been very authentic in his befriending of me. He's not pushy with some message that he wants to, you know, cram down my throat. But, but, but in the context of that relationship, he would just share uh, what it meant to him to follow Christ. And I, that was like news to me. I was 17 years old, first guy. Very instrumental. He didn't actually lead me to Christ. Uh, that happened a couple years later. But he was somebody that God put in my way. God arranged that, uh, probably for lots of other reasons, but definitely for me, Roger was a key. I think about a guy, I don't even know his name, he was a retired King County uh, Sheriff Chaplain. And I'll, I'll tell you the quick story. My grandmother, who also was not a Christian, that was just the way that our, our the larger family, not very, not very many believers anywhere in that whole lineage, um, and my grandmother worked as a waitress for years and years and years, decades, at a little restaurant in Edgewood, Washington called Knowles. If you know where that's at, that's pretty cool. But she worked there for years and years, and, um, and because she worked there so often, uh, so much, that there were, she had regular customers, and they just like knew Marilyn. Oh, Marilyn's our waitress today, and, you know, as she has been for 25 years. And uh, this, this guy that was the chaplain, they would come in with the deputy sheriffs and such and have their meals or whatever, and... and in the context of just the customer waitress uh, relationship, this this guy befriended my grandmother. Years later, my grandmother's dying of emphysema. Now, this is almost 20 years ago. Now, she passed away in, in the summer of '98, and so mid '90s, '96, I think it was. This guy's whoever he was, I don't know. He's praying, and he and Marilyn comes to his mind. And he thinks, I need to get a hold of her. So he calls Noel's restaurant. They say, no, she retired some time ago. Is there any way I could get a hold of her? And they gave her, gave him my grandmother's information, which probably at this point in life would be a bad idea. But at that moment, it was good. He calls Marilyn, my grandmother, and says, hey, I, I'd like to pay you a visit. Could I do that? She says, 
okay, my grandpa's off at work, and he comes in, and, um, and he sits down, and they're just reminiscing. And in the context of that, he gets out a little napkin and draws out the plan of salvation. So he draws out this little illustration that shows that God loves us, uh, and that, but because we have not upheld his righteous standards, there's this gap between us that needs to be bridged, but we can't bridge that gap ourselves. And so, but, but Christ did it. And so he draws this illustration out how Jesus, through his, through his work on the cross, bridged the gap so that we could be reconciled to God. And he says, Marilyn, do you understand that? And she's like, it dawns on her. I get it. And he says, well, would you like to receive Christ? And she says, yes, right? So he leads her to Christ, and, she, and then he says, and then he says, um, is there anybody you'd like to tell about this? And she goes, yeah, I, I know exactly who I'm going to tell first, my grandson. That would be me, right? At this point, I'm a youth pastor. She calls me at the church office, and she says, Brent, I just wanted to let you know, um, actually, she says, Bear, which was my childhood name. She calls the church office and asks for Bear. I was like, I was glad I answered the phone. Thanks, Grandma. Um, and so she goes, she goes, honey, there's just something I want to tell you. I received Christ today as my Savior. And I was like, hold on, Grandma. I'm going to be down there in just a few minutes, right? So I go down there, and I see this napkin. And she, and she had told this guy, that's what my grandson's been trying to tell me all this time. I was like, this is awesome, right? Uh, God had arranged that, right? In a special way, God had arranged that. And um, I think about just yesterday. So I, I, went to, I went to work at Starbucks yesterday. I don't work at Starbucks, I guess, an employee, but I went to Starbucks to get some work done. And so first thing I did is I... Cranked out some email on my, on my computer. Then I put my computer away, and typical on Saturdays, I'll, I'll just review my sermon notes and such. And so I brought my Bible out, and I, my, my sermon notes, and I'm just sitting there kind of looking through the scriptures and looking over my notes and hoping that there's something here that could be beneficial to you people. And, um, and praying, and, and, and I, but I look over, and there's three young ladies sitting across the room, and, and they're looking at me, but not like in a weird way, not like a creepy way. <laughs> But I was like, huh, that's interesting. Well, after about 15 minutes, one of them gets up, and she comes over, and in really, really broken English, she, just, just a sweet spirit, she, she says, in re, like I said, in really broken English, she's very surprised that I would sit in a public setting with my Bible open. And, and then she says to me, she goes, I love Jesus. I love Jesus, right? And I'm like, this is cool, right? So I said, okay, tell me about yourself. Tells me her name. She works as a nanny on Mercer Island, but her and her two friends are up here to see the Tulip Festival. And, um, and so we start talking, and then she starts using this translator on her phone. So she'd type it in. Uh, they're from Brazil. All three of them are from Brazil. And so she's having a hard time communicating, but she's just telling me that it's not very common to see somebody with a Bible out in public and how she really thought that was special. And so we start talking about the gospel and just how good God is. And it was just a very natural, fun conversation. And, uh, and, and, then, um, and then they left. Well, sitting next to me was a young student, young lady who's a student at Skagit College. And she hears all of this conversation, and we strike up a conversation. And she's from Japan. I'm like, this is so cool. These three people are from Brazil. You're from Japan. I said, how long? Did you grow up in America? She says, no, I've only been here since last fall when I came to be a student here in the nursing program. I said, you grew up in Japan. You've only been in America for these handful of months. You speak such good English. She goes, yes. I said, how, where did you learn it? She goes, I taught myself. I said, wow, that was impressive. So we just had this conversation, and I started to say, this is why these people came over and talked to me. And I and I shared the whole gospel with her about the love of God. And she was telling me about the way she grew up and about what people in Japan believe about the gods and spirituality and those types of things. And, I, and then I shared with her my testimony of coming to Christ and, and the gospel. And then I said, you know, I have some friends who are a part of Skagit College. 
And she goes, oh, yes? I said, yeah, one of them's name is Jason Swingle. Boom! <laughs> huh? And, and she goes, oh, I know Jason. So we got to talk, brother. We got to talk. <laughs> oh, I know Jason. So it's this really fun conversation. And I wished her, you know, luck in her schooling and all of that. But it was a divine encounter. At some point, I'm praying that that young lady receives Christ as her Lord. And she'll look back and say, I met this weird guy at Starbucks one day, right? And I'm like, I'll, I'll own that. As a, that'll, be a, that'll be a win. But you have people in your life like that, that God has arranged to bring you to Christ. And that's kind of what we have in our passage of Scripture this morning. So Acts chapter 8 is where we're at, right? So remember, we're studying through the book of Acts, and we've gotten introduced to this guy named Philip, and Philip was one of the seven that was chosen through, uh, from among the church members there to help serve the widows who were being neglected because the church was growing so fast that all of the needs, they were trying to scramble and meet all the needs, but that wasn't, it wasn't happening the way they needed to, so they needed to kind of increase the, the ministries of the church, and Philip was one of the guys that was chosen to uh, help make sure the widows were taken care of because that's the very heart of God, right? And so, um, and then, but then we see that Philip also does other things, and he's the one who, he's the one who took the big chance, and, and because of the persecution that was taking place in Jerusalem after Stephen's martyrdom, that he travels up to Samaria, which was a big, you know, ethnic racial barrier there, and, but he goes up and he brings the gospel to the Samaritans. Well, today we see him blazing some new trails regarding uh, the, what the, the work of God in his life, and, and the Spirit leads him to an Ethiopian man. And so this is a really, a really cool encounter. I want you to, I'll read through this text, starting in verse 26. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Now, stop for just a moment. Now we're going to quote the Old Testament. So the latter part of verse 32 and the rest of verse 33 is a quotation from the, the book of Isaiah, 53rd chapter. Okay, so that's where we're at. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus and was passing through, and as he was passing through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So a really cool story here, right? This encounter that's taking place. Philip had been in Samaria. Now, I want you to, I want you to bring up this map. Just, it's a, the scale here is difficult because we've got to see so much of, what's, of, of what it is. But if, if you look just to the right of the Mediterranean Sea, which is east of the Mediterranean Sea, for some reason I had a mental block, and on the, in the first gathering I said that was west. I know my right from my left, and I know you never eat soggy wheat, northeast, southwest. So you get it, right? So we're uh, east of the Mediterranean. You can see Jerusalem there. Right? Now, it's hard to see in the scale, because, but Samaria, uh, the, the city of Samaria is about 35 miles north of Jerusalem. And then you can see down to the lower left there of Jerusalem, the, the little marker of Gaza. 
and we know that the Gaza Strip, right? That's modern day stuff. And so it's right down there. So there's this trade route that runs across northern Africa and, 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 the, and the, uh, the eastern side of Africa that runs up into Egypt and then runs up into the Middle East uh, areas, right? Through Gaza and then Jerusalem. So this is, this is a, it's a desert place. It's pretty uninhabitable between Jerusalem and Gaza, but that's what we see. And then you look down where it, uh, it says Ethiopia, and of course, the boundaries were a little different. The borders were a little different then. So what, what is biblically Ethiopia is in what we know as modern-day Sudan, right? So it's north of Ethiopia, right? So right in there. You follow? So it's kind of, kind of, a, kind of a, give you a context there. But we're told some, some things about this Ethiopian eunuch that I think are, are worth knowing, at least, my, at least to me. How about that? So, so but because, because, remember, the, the church was started right in Jerusalem, and it was started among Jewish people. That's the roots of the Christian churches is, is in, among the Jewish people because Jesus was Jewish, and that's where he, that's where he was crucified. That's where the church, church was birthed. But it was never meant for a particular ethnic group. It was meant for uh, the entire world. Right? It's made, it's, the gospel is for the earth, right? the whole earth. And today's Earth Day, so congratulations. The gospel is for the whole earth. And, um, and, and so, but it started in Jerusalem, and then we saw, uh, as, as it got established, then we saw that it stretched into Judea and Samaria. Uh, but this is interesting because this, this Ethiopian, it's a, it's a man who is of African descent, right? And so this is the first Gentile, a Gentile is somebody who, who's not Jewish. This is the first Gentile that the, that the gospel is purposely sent to. So, and, 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 and it's somebody from Africa. So the gospel reaches into Africa at, at, at the very earliest of, of stages in its development, which is pretty cool. And this guy, uh, this guy is a, it's, it says he's a eunuch. And um, I'm going to give you the PG version of that. <laughs> a, a eunuch um, is somebody who's been taken care of in such a way that he could not compete with the king's harem. A lot of times they were put in, they were put in charge, eunuchs were put in charge of the king's harem, all of the ladies that were in his harem, and they were either impotent or castrated so that they couldn't compete with the king's harem, right? Well, for him, uh, and, and there were some who were called eunuchs or weren't that, they served in official capacities, really. They, they needed to be very trustworthy. They needed to be super loyal, and so they kind of took care of things that could distract a guy. Uh, from that loyalty and from that trustworthiness within these royal offices, so that they could, they, that the kings and the queens could really trust them. And this, because this guy's in charge of the queens, she, he, so he's a high ranking official in the queen's court, and, and he has direct access to the queen and all that. It's like he's a eunuch, right? There's no chance that this guy's gonna have any problems. Um, you follow, right? PG version, okay? Um, and if you don't know, just ask your parents or somebody if you don't quite get that. But that's what that means. So, but he's a court official with the queen. He's a place, it's a very prominent role. He's wealthy. We know that because he's got his own chariot, or at least he's a part of that whole, you know, wealthy society because he's in a chariot. But also the fact that he has a copy of the Hebrew scriptures, they, those are very rare and they were very expensive. So he's got a copy of the Hebrew scriptures. And we know that he has got a high level of education because he's reading the Hebrew scriptures. A lot of Jewish people didn't even at this point know the Hebrew language. They were speaking Aramaic. But he's reading the Hebrew scriptures. So this guy's likely very wealthy, serving in the queen's court. Uh, this, this name title, uh, Candace, we would pronounce it Candace, like that's the name that we would call. But it's actually Candacy, and it's not, a, it's not a personal name. It's a title. It's a hereditary title that was passed down to the queens of Ethiopia, much like we would call... Uh, the leader of Rome, Caesar. That's not his name, it's his title, Caesar. Or Pharaoh of Egypt, that's not his name, it's his title. And so Candace is, is her title. And, and this guy, and this guy is, um, he's, he's in her royal court serving her in this official capacity. And so, uh, but, but he's somehow, he's a God-fearing man, meaning he, he recognizes uh, some sort of responsibility toward the one true God, and he travels up to Jerusalem from Ethiopia 
to go and worship God. So he's either, a full, he's either fully converted to Judaism as an Ethiopian, uh, which would be called a proselyte, uh, or he's at least partially converted, converted which they just called a God-fearing, a God-fearer. But he's, he, nonetheless, he's up there and he's worshiping the one true God in Jerusalem. So he's got this sense of responsibility, this sense of understanding that, that, that there is this, this one true God that he is uh, accountable to. And so that's what we've got. So we've got our bearings. Now, l- let's go through the passage. So we've, we've seen this. The angel of the Lord shows up, verse 26, says to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, court official, of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah, right? And then it says, the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join the chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So Philip's been in Samaria, and incredible things are taking place up there, right? Crowds and crowds of people from Samaria are hearing and responding to the gospel. The church is being is growing, like the family of God is growing exponentially up in Samaria, and Philip's the one who was that initial encounter bringing the gospel up there. So this is big stuff, and we think, well, well why this supernatural um, interruption to that? Why, why does, why does the, the, the angel of the Lord have to show up? Well, this is what I say. Point number one, God arranges for good news to be shared. God arranges for good news to be shared. And we, we wonder, I mean, the, the reality is most of the time, God's not working in these incredible supernatural ways. Most of the time, the way the gospel spreads is just Christian people, people who love God, who follow Jesus, who care about others, uh, genuinely, authentically care about others, and then they share the gospel with them in the context of that relationship. That's most of the time how that happens. But, but we, we have to wonder, why the angel of the Lord? Why does God lead Philip this way? Uh, and, I, and we could only, I guess, um, suspect that God really needed to get Philip's attention because things were going so well there and he was so settled and so excited about what God was doing that it would take like a supernatural intervention in order to get his attention and go, oh, actually that happened to me one time. And I I mean, think I've been a Christian now for like 26, what, 27 years. And and I can think of one time when I had a dream, right? Which is a biblical thing, right? Dreams are a biblical thing, but they're not normal. They're not something that people have all the time. And I actually had a dream. I was settled, serving and working and loving this setting. And and then I had a dream that God used to go, whoa, I'm, I'm going to send you somewhere else. And I, if, ha, if I hadn't had that dream, I'm not sure I would have even considered it. So I, I think, hey, me and Philip, we're kind of, we got this one thing in, in common, right? But so, so, so Philip is, is serving in a way that he's, he's, he's being useful to God, and, but God has something else for him to do. And so God arranges for good news to be shared. That's a key thing. God arranges this, and it's really his sovereignty and his providence that he does these things that... Again, we are, as children of God, we're also servants of God, and servants aren't, a, aren't in a place to dictate to their master what to do. That God, We're wanting to be responsive to God's leading uh, in our lives. So here's what I see about Philip. Like, if we, if we want to be useful to God, if we want God to arrange these things, we can't be on pause. I think there are times when we think, I want God to use me, I want to be useful to God, so I'm going to sit idle until He tells me what to do. And it's like, we're going to wait till God gives us an angelic visitation before we move forward. And I don't think that's the right approach. I don't think that's a very good posture. Philip's very active doing things that God has called him to do. There's this persecution. He goes up to Samaria. What does he do? He shares the gospel, right? He's being useful to God in the context of his life. He's living the gospel with those inside the family. He's bringing the gospel to those outside the family. And in that atmosphere, God says, I want you to do something different. So I think the first thing that we would say is, if we want to be, if we want to be a part of this, this active work of God, uh, that we need to be active in the work of God. Does that make sense to you? So, so, but, but, and then we see that, that he's, he's sensitive 
to, um, he's sensitive to the Lord's leading. So this is a guy who, I mean, I don't know how sensitive you'd have to be in order for uh, the, an angel of the Lord. Like you could be probably pretty dense and have God get your attention with an angel. But here's what I love, that the angel says, rise and go. And the next thing we read is, he rose and went. I like that. And, and he does it on very limited in, in, in information. It says, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. What's missing from this? Why? Who? Here he is up in Samaria and all these incredible things are taking place. You, God would have to drag you away from that. And all he says is, go to the south to this road, this desert place, and it says he rose and went. See, here's what we got to get. Rarely, rarely does God tell a person everything they want to know. Uh, we're curious people. We want to know. We like information. And so when, when we're saying, okay, God, here's what I want you to, here's what, here's, I want to be useful to you, and, 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 but you got to tell me everything I want to know before I'm going to get up. That's not a good, again, that's not a good posture to have before the Lord. Because then we're, we're, we're really inhibiting our own walk. We're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. So the, the faith, just the, just the concept of faith means we're not going to know everything. Especially not everything we want to know. So all he's told is to some direction. Not why, not who, just Go to the south. And, and he gets up and goes. Like That's pretty cool, right? I like that. So God's arranging this good news to be shared. He obeys unlimited information. And then we see he's very eager. So he goes to the south. And all, oh, hey, on this road from Jerusalem to Gaza, is, he sees it's a long road, right? It's dozens of miles long. And, uh, and so evidently he's supposed to just walk this road until God gives him more revelation. Well, he sees a chariot, and he's like, whoa, maybe that's what God's doing. And so he comes up alongside of it, and, and, and then we see that he's very eager. The Spirit of the Lord says, go over and join this chariot, and it says he ran to him. There's a sense of eagerness. He's anticipating to be used of God, and so he's eager to be used of God, and when, when God tells him to do something, he's all about it, friends. He's running to it. Right? And I, I like that. And then, and then he's the one who engages. This is, a, this is important. I think sometimes we, just, we want other people to start the conversation. We want other people to open that door. But, but I see, and, and again, this is, I'm, not, I'm describing what's taking place here. This isn't necessarily prescriptive. It's more descriptive, but I like that it's, he's telling us how this happened. He comes alongside the chariot, and Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He doesn't wait to be invited. He says, do you understand what you're reading? And the, and the, 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 the eunuch says, oh, how can I? Right? So, and of course, that's a key, question, that's a key statement. He's making us, how can I? He's, he's gone to Jerusalem. He's recognizing who God is. He's worshiping God. He's reading the scriptures, but he doesn't understand what he's reading. How can I? unless someone guides me. See, friends, that's a key, that God uses us to be helpful to other people. Because spiritual truth, it, the Bible's clear, but it's not obvious to somebody who is not a believer. Because the Scriptures say that it's spiritually discerned. It's understood. So last week, we talked about how when a person comes to faith in Christ, they're born into the kingdom of God, they're gifted with eternal life. They're adopted into the eternal family of God. And the way that, the way that God kind of uh, solidifies the deal is He puts His Spirit inside of us. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and resides within us, and it's the Spirit Himself who bears witness with us that we belong to God. Right? And so, uh, and it's the Spirit within us that gives us an understanding of the things of God. That helps us to understand. So this eunuch, he's not able to understand because the Spirit of God is not inside of him, enlightening him. So God uses, God uses his people, he arranges for good news to be shared, and he uses, he uses his people to help other people become aware of their need for a Savior. Right? 
like Roger did for me, like the chaplain did for my grandmother, like I'm hoping happened yesterday with this gal, right? You follow? So, but, uh, but he's not able to understand it because it's spiritually discerned. Uh, and think about it, even the apostles, after, after walking with Jesus for three plus years, listening to his teaching, seeing his miracles, still after the resurrection, Jesus had to open their eyes and help them understand how he is the fulfillment of messianic prophecy from the Old Testament. Right? He had, Jesus had to enlighten them. He had to reveal to them that he is that. Right? And so look, look at this verse from 1 Corinthians 2. It says, the man without the Spirit, and again, we already talked about that, the man without the Spirit is not somebody who's who's born again. They're not somebody who's born into the kingdom of God yet. The Spirit of God does not dwell within them yet. So the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Right? So that's why God's, God's way is to use us to help other people, because this eunuch, he understands that he needs a guide, and God has arranged it so that Philip is that guide for him. So the, the eunuch was, had some, at least some level of conversion, if you will, to Judaism, but he's still in the dark with regards to the gospel, to, with regards to the good news of God's salvation, and he needed somebody to help him understand. So God arranges for this good news to be shared, but, but we have to recognize we're almost getting the cart in front of the horse here, and that's where we're going to go with the next section of this, is before God can arrange for good news to be shared, he has to arrange that there is good news to share, right? So, so look at, look at verse, uh, verses 32 through 38 now. And this is part of that, first part is that quote from Isaiah. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him, who can describe his generation for this? For his life was taken away from the earth. And so the eunuch's asking this question. Who's he talking about, himself or somebody else? And then this is, that's powerful. Verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, beginning with the Isaiah 53 passage, he tells him the good news about Jesus, right? There's good news to be shared, right? And as they're going down along the road, they come to this place of water and they see the water and he asked the question, the eunuch asked the question, what prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So God has, God has arranged for there, de, for there to be good news, right? So, so that, that reminds us that there is good news to be shared, right? And, and so, um, I don't know. If, if you're like me, I, I try to stay up on the news, but it is difficult, one, to stay up on the, um, the enormity of the amount of news, but the hardest part for me is how bad the news is. That I start reading the headlines, and I, I, like all the little air just flows right out of my little balloon, right? I'm like, my goodness, this world is messed up. There's not a whole lot of good news. So that when we have one day in the forecast when there's sunshine, we're like, good news, good news, right? But when we're talking about good news, like Bible good news, it's not about the weather, right? So I want to, sometimes, sometimes we get familiar with certain words or phrases, and as followers of Christ, we're pretty sure we got a pretty good idea what it means, um, but sometimes it's really good to, in a concise way, define some things. And I want to do that for you this morning. And I would really encourage you, if you're a note taker, take notes. Uh, if you want to take a picture of the slide, you can. Um, but I want to encourage you because we're talking about God. Uh, God has arranged for there to be good news to be shared. And God arranges for that good news to be shared. And he's using us for that purpose. Then you want to be able to know what the good news is, right? So let me define these phrases for you. So what are we talking about when we're talking about the Bible's good news? So the good news according to the Bible is just this. In spite of our failures and apart from our efforts, we can be at peace with God. This peace is a gift from God as we trust in the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So quickly, I just want to make sure we're getting that. That in spite of our failures, so, so that means regardless 
of anything that we have done that's wrong or that we haven't done that we should have done. Both sides, right? And if, if you're like me, I, I still remember the things that I did that uh, I'm ashamed of, right? That I just wish, one, I wish it didn't happen. Two, I wish I couldn't remember it, right? And the reality is the, the clearer picture we get of who God is in His majesty and in His holiness and in all of His glory, the worse we're, we will feel, not in still bearing the guilt of that sin, but we'll be more aware of just how bad we were, right? And just how much God has done for us. So even a white lie would prick our conscience because we see who God is. But the good news is that in spite of our failures, whether they're large or small, whether there's a mountain, a, a, a molehill or a mountain, in spite of our failures, right? And apart from our efforts. So as humans, we, we want to be a participant. We want to we have something to do, to contribute to. And, but the gospel says, the good news says, nope, it, it's something that has been done for you. That you can't work for it, that you don't deserve it, that you can't earn it. It's a gift. So in spite of our failures and apart from our efforts, we can be at peace with God. And at peace with God is a relational phrase. So, so that means we're on, a, on peaceful terms with God, that God isn't holding anything against us, right? In spite of our failures and apart from our effort. So we can, we, it's something that we receive by faith. We trust, and that's where this last part is. God, uh, that, that the peace is a gift from God as we trust in the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That, that God gifts us with His with His salvation, right? And so, look at this passage of Scripture, uh, Second Tim, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. There's one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So, the eunuch knew of the one true God, but he didn't know the mediator. So, he recognized that he was responsible to the one true God, but he didn't realize that there was somebody who would stand in his stead, and now Philip's helping him understand that. So this mediator, why is, why is it that there is, there's one God, not many gods, right? The testimony of the Scriptures is there's one God, and there's one mediator to Him. There's one, there's one, there's not many roads to God, there's one road, right? This is the testimony of Scripture, that there is one God and one road to God. And why is that? Why wouldn't God make many roads? Well, friends, there's, there's a, lot, a lot that could be said about that, but only Jesus has done for us what we needed done. There's a lot of people that have said wise things in this world. There's a lot of people that have said smart things in this world. But there isn't anybody who's bore our guilt and then took our penalty and then conquered our enemies. So Jesus bears all of the sin of the world when he hangs on the tree. He dies the death that we deserve. And then he conquers death by coming back to life. That's why he's the one mediator. Other people have said smart things and done wise things, but only Jesus has done what we needed to have done, but we couldn't do it ourselves. That's why this is called good news, friends, right? So one more phrase. Can I define one more phrase for you? It's this word saved, right? We're talking about being saved, but often we forget, what are we talking about when we're talking about being saved? A Christian will say, and some of you that maybe are here and you're not a Christian, and you think, why do these Christians use these words? What do they mean they're saved, right? Well, this is what it means. Saved biblically means to be rescued from the destruction of sin, since sin by its very nature is destructive. And to be saved is to be rescued from its destruction and it's resulting condemnation. So the, so the end result of the destructive nature of sin is our own condemnation, right? That we will stand before God and He will condemn us, right? And, and, but, we, but to be saved because of the good news is to be rescued from the destruction of sin and its resulting condemnation and reconciled to God resulting in eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. So these are two concepts that are super important for us to get, right? So we're rescued from 
and we're rescued too. So, so on the front end, God, God rescues us from the destructive nature of sin, and, and, he, and He no longer will condemn us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 1, right? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But this goes, this goes further to tell us the full picture of the good news of the gospel in that we're not, God just doesn't, God doesn't just say, I don't think that's supernatural. I think that that's just the lights we're going down. God. Where were we? Um, God doesn't just say, okay, you're forgiven, you're free to go. That's not, that's not the full nature of the gospel. God says, okay, you're forgiven, you're free to come. We're not just rescued from something, we're rescued to something. God brings us into His eternal family. God brings us into eternal life. So we're saved to something as much as we're saved from something. And friends, if we're talking about God, we're wanting, like, we're going to take our lead from Philip here this, this morning and say, we want, God, we want you to uh, use us in your arrangements. Use us to help bring good news to other people. Well, now you have an understanding. If you didn't have the words before, now you have an understanding of the good news and of salvation, right? You follow? So this is what's taking place here. God has arranged for there to be, for there to be good news. And it's interesting because the eunuch, he just, he, right, like, he just happens to be reading Isaiah 53. Not difficult to see the providence of God here, that God has arranged this. The, that the eunuch would be reading the Hebrew Scriptures at all is amazing. But the fact that he's reading Isaiah 53 is evidence of the incredible, wonderful timing of God. Isaiah 53 is the apex passage of Scripture in all of the Old Testament describing who the Messiah is and what he would do on behalf of those he was doing it for. One commentator called uh, Isaiah 53 the Mount Everest of Messianic prophecy. There's no happenstance here, friends. This is, this is divine providence. And Philip just happens to be able to explain it. Again, no happenstance here. Philip is prepared to be useful to God. And that's an important key for us, to be prepared to be useful to God. So Philip, he had studied his Bible and he knew it. Not likely that he had his doctor's degree in it. He did not, he probably didn't have, he wasn't a doctor of ministry, didn't have his PhD, but he knew his Bible, friends. He knew the gospel. He was prepared when, when an opportunity presented itself, he could share that good news. He could say, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. So he wasn't illiterate. He took it as a personal responsibility as a Christian to be, to be able to be a witness for Christ. You have to be able to share the gospel. And if you're a Christian, you need to be able to share the gospel, right? Because you're supposed to be a witness for Christ. Amen, right? So he's able to tell the eunuch that these verses that he's reading out of Isaiah are, are really about Jesus. He's able to explain to him that though Jesus, he's this, this, and again, when we read Bible prophecy, it's like poetry that you don't, like you have to really read it and study it and think about it to get it, right? So the sheep and the lamb here is being compared to Christ, that he, that he was innocent, and in his innocence, though, he bore our guilt so that we could receive God's grace, right? That God was going to be gracious to us. So he's the sacrificial lamb here who became our substitute, and he suffered on our behalf, and he was denied justice. In his humiliation, it says he was denied justice. He was denied justice so that God could show us his mercy. So he's, that's why he's, when we talk about, in, you know, kind of big theological phrases like substitutionary atonement, the, the, the sin, a, sin can't be atoned for. It can't be covered and removed without the substitution. Either we bear the guilt of our sin or we, we who did it on our behalf. So he's our, he is the, the, the sacrificial lamb of God. He is the one who bore our guilt and then because he suffered the death that we, was intended for us, the wages of sin is death, right? That's Romans 3. Then, then we can look to him, trust him for the removal of that guilt, and we can be at peace with God, right? 
So this is Philip's able to, t- able to do this. And again, we don't have to have a PhD to be able to do that. We don't have to have a master's level education to be able to do that. But we do need to understand some things, and then we need to be useful to God, be- meaning we need to be ready and prepared. So this is Philip. He's prepared himself to be, to be a witness for Christ. Look at this verse. One more in this section here. 1 Peter chapter uh, 3. This is, this is the Apostle Peter's counsel to uh, Christians. He says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's, that's, there's such, uh, man, just such rich counsel in this, that in our hearts, we're living in this world that is, a, that is a wonderful in lots of ways and twisted and depraved in lots of ways. And, and we're told as, as, um, uh, uh, as, as Christians in this world that we need to be sure that Christ is, is honored in our hearts as holy. And then we're always prepared that when we, go, when we go out and about in our day, whether it's work or in our neighborhoods or whatever, we're, we're ready. We're thinking, God, would you use me today? God, I'm preparing my mind, my heart, so that if you crack a door open, I'm going to be able to give an answer to anyone who asks me, right, for the hope that, that, that is in me. And then again, this, this counsel, you do it with gentleness and respect, I think, too, too often, there are people who confess to be Christians who are very belligerent in their pushiness, and I, 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 I don't want to judge them. I'm not trying to, uh, in my language, condemn them, but I say they, 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 they confess to be Christians, but man, by their demeanor, you're like, well, where's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Where is it? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, come on, where's the love? And they're just so... Just, just pushy and belligerent. You're like, I don't think I want anything that you're trying to push on me. You know what I mean? The script. I mean, the scriptures are clear here. Do it with gentleness and respect. Prepared. And when you give a defense, when you give an answer to somebody who asks you for the hope that you have that's in you, give it. Do it with gentleness and respect. That's what we're told, right? So be prepared to be a witness for Christ. Then, uh, okay, so, so, so the eunuch happens to be reading Isaiah 53. Philip happens to be able to, 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 to explain to him what it means, showing him that this good news is all about Jesus. And, and, then, and then they happen upon some water. Now, I like this, right? Uh, they're going along the road, and, and they came to some water. Now, he's in a chariot. It's likely they have jugs of water because they're in a desert place. Nobody traveled in these caravans without water. So it wasn't like they couldn't have said, hey, here's some water in this jug, pour it over my head, and that, that equates to baptism. Ah, what? There's a mode to baptism? Could you be baptized by sprinkle, sprinkling water on somebody's head? Yeah, you could, but it's not telling the whole story. Not according to this. The eunuchs, notice they went down into the water, right? So, so just, again, this is descriptive, but I, I think... Water baptism, telling the, it's the living illustration of what it means to be a Christian, that we die to our sin. And when somebody dies, they get put in the ground. You don't sprinkle dirt on top of them. You put them in a grave six feet under, right? So that's why we baptism, baptize by immersion, that they go all the way down under the water. And I tell the baptism candidates, don't try to hold your head up because I will shove you into the water. <laughs> and I do this with gentleness and respect, Right? But, but I, I say, it's, the picture is full, of, full submersion or to be immersed because that's the, that's the illustration that's being portrayed. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you're going down into the water saying, I'm, I'm dying to my sin, dying to self, and I'm being raised by the Spirit of God. I'm being raised to new life like Christ was, right? So that's what we see taking place here. He says, hey, there's water, and they get down out of the chariot, go down into the water, and they, and they come up. So it's like this is, this is his initial testimony, which means... Philip had to have explained the gospel clearly enough to him to where he would understand he needed to be baptized in water because the eunuch's the one that brought it up. The eunuch said, hey, there's water. What's keeping me from being baptized? It wasn't Philip saying, you know, you're going to need to be baptized. You understand? If you're a Christian and you haven't been baptized, you haven't understood the gospel fully yet. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm just saying you haven't understood the gospel fully yet because the next thing in the Bible, the next thing they did after becoming a Christian, to give that living testimony, that initial testimony of their faith to be baptized in water, right? And you have a connection card in front of you. You could use that to say, it's time for me to be baptized, all right? It's important. 
If, if it wasn't important, it wouldn't be over and over and over and over in the book of Acts, right? You can say amen. Now, are you all paying attention? I wonder if you are. I just wonder if you are. I think you are, but did you realize, did you notice? There's no verse 37. What? 34, 35, 36, 38. What's going on right now? Unless you have an old English Bible, like a King James Bible translated, started in 1604, finalized in 1611. King James got together a bunch of Bible translators, and they were going to finally translate the Bible from its original language, Old Testament, Hebrew, New Testament, Greek, and Aramaic, and they got the best manuscripts that they had available at that time, and they sat down, and over the course of these years, they translated the Bible, and the King James Bible in its day was remarkable. It was really a work of God. Not, I mean, it was a translation, so we understand, you know, that, that, that it's, it's still a translation. Nonetheless, um, you say, why is verse 37 missing? Well, since 1611, it's been a while, right? There have been, there have been a remarkable amount of archeolo archaeological finds. They have found massive amounts of um, biblical manuscripts that, um, that are older than what they had available in, 16, in the early 1600s, and that are much more, as they've studied them, because they have thousands of portions of the New Testament, uh, in, in, from archaeological finds, thousands of them, right? And as they study them and cross-reference them and all of that, they've, they found that the manuscripts that were available in the early 1600s are not as reliable as the ones they've found since then. And so what they've, what they've realized is, and they've tracked it probably to the second century, that there was a commentator that inserted what we know as verse 37 in for clarification so that the readers would understand that Philip actually did become a Christian before he was baptized. Because you're not supposed to be baptized until you're a Christian, right? So, so that's not to confuse us and to make us think, can we rely on the Scriptures? Yeah, I think we can rely on the Scriptures. In these translations, there's, there's, there's a remarkable amount of, of uh, expert labor that has gone into this. But just to point that out, some of you are like, wait a second, there's no verse 37. That's why, right? The, the, the manuscripts that... that were available in the early 1600s, weren't as reliable as what they have now, and they've realized. And again, the chapters and verses are inserted for reference sake. When, they were, when Luke was being inspired by the Spirit, he didn't say, chapter 1, verse 1, da, 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 verse 2. He didn't write the 1, 2, 3s in. Those were added so that we could refer to them when we're teaching and preaching, right? Make sense? All right. So, what do we know so far? We know that God has arranged for there to be good news, and he has arranged for good news to be shared. And lastly, we see in this last bit of this story, something pretty cool. God has arranged, uh, God's arrangements always have another frontier. Look at verse 39. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So God, God's used Philip in wonderful ways, but there's another frontier for him. So, so he used him in Samaria, now he's used him with the eunuch, and now he's doing something additionally with Philip. And we see this, and even the eunuch's got a new frontier. He's, his new frontier is home, but it's with a new lease on life, right? He's going back to Ethiopia with hope. He's going back to Ethiopia. It says, what does it say? That he went on his way rejoicing. You know, joy, a deep a deep-seated kind of a peaceful joy um, is, is the fruit of salvation. Not, and it isn't that we, again, I think sometimes we misinterpret that and we think, well, that means we walk around with some silly grin on our face all the time. That's not, what, that's not what Bible joy, good news joy is. It's this settled peacefulness that you recognize you've been reconciled to God and that you're not alone, you're not orphaned in this world, and that this life isn't all there is, that you've been gifted with eternal life. And when you have that perspective, there's something settled in your soul that even when you're going through really tough things, you, you know God is with you. You know that it's not out of His control. And so there's a joy. He's going on His way rejoicing. He's happy to be saved. And we've already defined that phrase, haven't we? He's happy to be saved. And He goes into His, into his um, back home to His new frontier with this, with this um, 
new lease on life. And then we see old Philip, he's got a new frontier as well. He ends up in Caesarea. Now, Caesarea is um, up the coast, the Mediterranean coast, uh, several dozen miles. And, and, and it's interesting because this is the last time we hear about Philip for 20 years. 20 years later, we pick up toward the end of the book of Acts, we pick up, he's still in Caesarea. And he's got a family, he's got four daughters, and they're serving the Lord, and it's really cool, right? So his new frontier, he starts out, what's happening right now? It says, they come up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord carries Philip away. Well, there's two ways we could think about that. One, we could say he's like transported, which is like, we could think that that's possible. The whole Bible is full of miraculous stories. Don't think this is like, what? There's no way God could do that. Yeah, he spoke the entire world into existence, but he couldn't get one guy from one place to another, you know, 20 miles away, miraculously, right? I mean, if, if we're talking about people being raised from the dead, lame people walking, blind people seeing, we're talking about, you know, miracles all over the place, and this, like, so that could happen. In the, in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it talks about how the church is going to be caught up and meet the Lord in the air, in, in the clouds. When he comes back, the church is going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, which is like kind of the culmination of the, the end time stuff. Pretty awesome. Same Greek word used. So you're like, oh, okay, it could be miraculous. Or it could just be like he was whisked away. I kind of lean toward the supernatural part because in verse 40, it says that he found himself in Azotus. And you're like, he's, he doesn't know how. He's like, I just, I don't know how that happened right? Pretty awesome. But then, I, this is, I, like, I love the Bible. I like to just sit and think about, like, what would it have been like for Philip? Because we, we like that supernatural stuff. That's pretty cool. But, you know, most of the time, God works naturally. Because look at Philip. What happens? He finds himself in Azotus, and then he passed through. He's just walking on his way, and as he's heading up toward to Caesarea, he's preaching the gospel to all the towns that he came, comes to. Just very natural. He's just, a, he's just an authentic man who loves God, who's following Jesus, and wants to be useful to God in whatever way he can. And that's what he's doing. And he ends up in, in, in Caesarea. Right? So, so God works supernaturally in, at times. And I, man, I affirm that 100%. But, but I, don't want to, um, I don't want to just wait for those supernatural times I want God to use me naturally as well. You follow? Right? So that's, that's what's taking place here. So God makes these arrangements. And the new frontier, here's, well, let's close with this. The new frontier is always about helping other people come to know Christ. So, so maybe you've been used wonderfully in the past. There's another frontier for you. Right? God, is not, God is not shelving you saying, hey, we'll see you in eternity. You've been used enough, and no, I think as long as we have breath, there's a new frontier for us, right? And maybe for some of you, you're like, I, I don't know, God doesn't use me very much. My, my guess is He uses you more than you're aware, which I think is pretty cool, that God can use us in ways that we don't even know He's using us. And then maybe on, on this side of eternity, He'll show us what He was doing. And we're like, what? I had no idea. That'd be awesome, huh? But the, I think the key is we want to be useful to God. So here's, here's my main idea this morning, right? That the Savior of the world saves the world one person at a time. Like, we could look at what was going on in Samaria where we last saw Philip and go, look at that, it's incredible. Crowds and crowds of people are, are coming to Christ and that's awesome. But the people in Samaria, as important as they are, are no more important than the one guy who's traveling from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. And God takes Philip down there to make sure he hears the gospel too, right? So the Savior of the world, we, I, man, I want the spectacular. I want this big. That would be so great, right? But I, but I want to share the gospel with the one person that's next to me, right? So... Um, so here's what I want you to think about. Let's close, let's close with this thought. Here's what I want you to think about. Who's one person? And let's say one person in this valley that you would say, I'm going to pray for that person 
And I'm going to look for opportunities to share the good news with them. Who's that one person? And I want you to pull out your connection cards. And I want you to write their first name. Don't tell me your last, their last name. Don't give me their email address. Don't say, hey, Brent, you call them. <laughs> no, I'm not calling them for you. It's your person. And you might be able to think of lots of people, and that's wonderful. But I want you to, for the sake of this application, just go one person. Who's one person that I can say, I'm going to pray for this person, and I'm going to look for opportunities to share the good news with them. Write their first name on the connection cards. You'll remember who they are, but when, when that list gets distributed, all the prayer requests and all that from the connection cards, that gets sent out to our staff and our pastors and elders, and we pray for those every week, and we'll see this long list of these first people's names. That'll be cool, right? And we'll pray with you in that regard. So that's for those of you that are Christians. But let me talk with you for just a minute for those of you that aren't Christians. You are loved by God more than you can imagine, more than any of us could fathom, that God would love us to the extent, in spite of our failures, that God would love us to the extent that he would give his only son to bear our penalty and to conquer our enemies, that we might be saved, that you might be saved. You see, the Savior of the world, Jesus is the Savior of the world, and He's saving the world one person at a time. But the testimony of the Scriptures is this. The whole world is not going to be saved. My question is, will you be, will you be saved? And the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, that you will be saved that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. So if you're at that place where you would say, I, I understand the good news, and I want to be saved. I want to be rescued from the destructive nature of sin and its ensuing condemnation. I want to be, I want to be reconciled to God if, that's, if, you, if you've said, I understand that and I want to receive Christ, then you can at this moment. Just say, Lord God, I don't understand everything, but I, I, I do now understand my need to receive Jesus Christ by faith. And in receiving him, I'll receive your gift of salvation. So I put my faith in Christ. I turn away from sin. I'm sorry, God, for falling short of your standards. Forgive me. And I put my trust in Christ. And friend, if that's your prayer this morning, would you please indicate that by just marking that on your connection card? I'd love to be able to follow up. I'm not going to inundate you. or with just. I just want to know that you've received Christ. So God, bless your church, I pray. Help us to embrace this good news. Strengthen your people, Lord, through and through. I pray as we go from this place today that we will go with a sense of your great grace, your love, your strength, your hope. As we face this new week, that it will be with a, with a knowledge that you want to use us and that you're arranging things for us to be used to bring good news to others. So help us to be aware of it, Lord. We look to you for that. Your name be praised.